you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Titus chapter 2. Uh, we're going to continue our series. We are three weeks into a four-week series in the book of Titus entitled Invasion. And I chose this title because the Apostle Paul is, is given encouragement to his protege in the faith, Titus. Titus, uh, Titus and Timothy were kind of two young pastors who had a tremendous responsibility. Timothy was at the church at Ephesus, and Titus had installed this Greek convert, this Gentile convert, into being the uh, pastor at a church on the island of Crete. And we'll, we will get into that in just a minute. But as he's talking to, to Titus and trying to encourage Titus in his ministry, he, he's going to conclude something that's really important and really relevant to us. And this is how we got the title Invasion. He says to Timothy, or excuse me, to Titus, if the world invades the church, the world will invade you. The world will invade the lives of people. But if Christ invades a life, that life will invade the world. And so he's giving this, this young pastor, Titus, he's going to give him five encouragements throughout the book. And, and they're really pretty simple. First, he says, and we looked at this in our first week, base everything you do on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then last week, we looked at the second two things, and that is strengthening straighten out the bad doctrine, the bad practices that are going on in the church, and then surround yourself with godly leaders who can help you with the work and, and really get into the trenches and do ministry at the point of need. And then today we're going to look at a, a, th- a fourth encouragement, really the third encouragement in the book, and that you must personally invest the Jesus in you into the lives of others. And then next week we're going to close out by how together they're the gate of the world in Jesus' name. So as a real quick recap, in chapter, we started out the book by, by going to chapter 3 instead of starting in chapter 1. The reason we did that is because Paul does something a little unique compared to the way he writes most books. If you read Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, those books, even Romans, Paul has a tendency to start out and give a greeting and then say, here's the doctrinal Here's the doctrinal basis, and here is the behavior that ought to come as a result of this doctrine that you've allowed to come into your life. But in the book of Titus, he changes things up a little bit. He starts out and gives a greeting, and then he gives the practicality, and then he goes to the doctrine. So we started in chapter 3 because the heart of the book is, is really critical in understanding the whole of the book. And what he says is the doctrinal heart of the book is to Titus. He says, Titus, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And the fact of the matter is that everything, everything rises and falls on the cross. Everything rises and falls on the cross. And even more importantly, everything rises and falls on whether the cross, Jesus Christ, has invaded your heart, your life. And see, the, the, the truth is, is that as Christians, there is nothing else more important than the gospel. There's nothing more important than the fact that God saw the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him, that God allowed the son to become flesh, to become incarnate, to, to, to come and to become a second Adam so he could atone for the mistakes of the first Adam. And in the cross, we find God's single solution to the problem of sin. And that as Christians, we must be tethered to the cross. There's nothing more important than the cross. And so Paul really drives us home in chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Then last week, we looked at the two, the two things that Titus needed to do in order to protect the church. There was really three things. I, I broke them up. The first two things are that he had to, to straighten out. The bad practices. If you remember, we, when we, in our first week when we talked about this, the church at Crete was a, a church that was getting pressure both from within and without. Without, they were facing the culture of Rome. They were facing the Greek culture. They were fa- facing the, the gods and the, and, the, and the ideas of Asia Minor. So it was just a melting pot of religion. But then internally, there was a group of people known as Judaizers who were trying to bring a Jewish approach to Christianity, basically ignoring the cross and saying that you've got to keep the law and you, have, and you have to be circumcised. And so with all this pressure, Paul says, you've got to get in and you've got to get right practices and right doctrines. You've got to sit down with all the leaders. You've got to sit down with the people and get this straight. And then second, you've got to get a group of people who can help you do it. 
We talked about how last week Paul, I mean, Titus didn't get to stand in front of a group of people like I do. That the church met in these house churches. And so he says you need to raise up these house church leaders, these house church under shepherds. Because they're the ones who are going to be really teaching the word of God. They're the ones that's going to be engaging people at the point of, the, at the point of their need. And so it's really important that they have correct doctrine. You must disciple them. You must raise them up, bring them up so that they can go and help you in the work of the, work of the church. Well, today we're going to transition, when we go into chapter 2, we're going to transition away from the problem of false teaching and the bad that was going on. And he's going to give Titus, and I believe he's given every one of us, especially someone like myself, a pastor, he's given us some very specific instructions on what is necessary after we straighten things out, after we raise up leadership, that together the leadership must be committed to making disciples. And what that looks like. And so Paul is going to offer in chapter 3, I believe, five really important directives on how to make disciples. Now, let me remind you of something. In fact, if you know this, why don't you say it with me? The Great Commission says this. Go into the world and make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all that I've commanded. And Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of age. That is our commission. That is not just the commission of the apostles. That is not just the commission of the, of, of, of the, of the pastors. It is every believer's commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And so he jumps into it, and it's very interesting. He says, number one, Titus, everyone's got to get this, but you especially have to get this. Disciple making requires a personal investment. It requires a personal investment. Now, you might not see that on the surface because he starts out and says in verse 1, you must teach what is appropriate with sound doctrine. He gave the same encouragement to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when he says, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others also. Now, what might get, what might get missed, because when you see the word teach, you think, well, that's what you're doing. You're teaching everyone. Yes, I am. I'm teaching everyone. But that's not what the word really means in the Greek here. The Greek word here is laleo. And what it means is not to stand in front of a bunch of people and start teaching truth. It actually means to have conversation, to speak. And the idea isn't to preach, but rather it is to sit down with someone and have regular dialogue with them. Where you ask questions and you give answers. It's very personal, very intimate. It's not a monologue like I'm doing right now. It's a dialogue where, where the body, where, where, where individuals get with other spiritually mature people and they begin to ask questions and they begin to grow together and they begin to help each other out. And see, the word here is a present tense imperative. Which I know to you, that just, that's just Greek to you. But what that really means is that there's an idea of persistence. Meaning that, that, that Titus and these house church leaders and the believers in these house churches, that they are to have regular, personal, intimate conversations about spiritual things. And, and this is at the heart. And this conversation is not just about right doctrine. It's about right behavior. It's about behavior that comes as a result of allowing the truth of God to come into you and to seep down into your soul. And you see, Paul's contention, in fact, in every one of Paul's books, he contends, if you have a right understanding with God, it is going to result in a behavior that substantiates this belief. Your belief drives your behavior. That's what he is saying here. Do you, do you know what we call this? Do you know what we call when two people get together and they begin discussing spiritual things with the intent of helping someone to grow up and so for someone to begin to live out their faith? You know what that's called? Discipleship. That's what it's called. And it's not that hard. It's just sitting down with someone and having spiritual conversation that's based on the truth of God with the intent of helping someone to become more intimate with God. That's what discipleship is. Now notice, he says, he gives two words. He says that it's appropriate sound doctrine. Very interesting words here. The word appropriate means fitting. It refers to behavior that's in alignment with one's belief. In other words, a person's faith should be conspicuous because it's revealed by their actions. 
You tell me you believe something. This is what James says. You tell me believe something, but I see no evidence. I would rather see someone who says, I believe this. And then there's evidence to prove what they say they believe. That's what Paul, that's what Paul's telling Timothy here, that we must not just talk about it. We must show it. We must live it. But then he also uses the word sound doctrine. Sound is a word we get help or hygiene. And then the word doctrine is essential foundational truth. So what he's saying is that when you get together, you're to talk about those beliefs that are critical, foundational to someone's spiritual well-being and spiritual health. And then you're to help them to begin to apply those so that they have a healthy, intimate relationship with God. Now, here's the thing. Such conversations require intentionality. Disciples are not made by osmosis. Disciples are made when one believer, growing believer, intentionally goes and engages another believer in this spiritual dialogue with the intent of taking that truth that's in them and pouring it into another person. I've used this example a number of times since I've been here because I think it's one of the greatest pictures of discipleship. And one time I actually had cups set across the stage and I stood over here with a bunch of water and I said, okay, how, how can I get this water in these cups? And if you remember, I can do one thing. I can throw the water at the cups and I'm going to get a lot more on the floor than I'm going to get in the cups. And that's really what I'm doing right now. I'm basically throwing the gospel, throwing the truth of God at you. And some of you are going, well, I hope it hits. Some of you are going, I I want this in my cup. But the reality is, this is one of the least effective ways of making disciples because it was never intended to make disciples. What I'm doing right now is intended to support the disciple making process. What I'm doing right now is to spur thoughts and attitudes in your mind so that when you go to lunch, when you sit down with a friend, you can say, you know, the pastor talked about this morning. Let's talk about it. Let's unpack this. Let's see the truth here so that we can grow together from it. Discipleship is when I take This truth that's in me, instead of throwing it, I walk it over and I pour directly into someone else who's desiring to grow. And that's the call. That's what he's saying here. It requires a personal investment. And then if we are going to keep the world out of the church, and if we're going to keep the world out of the believer, it requires that that individually we have life-to-life relationships with other men, with other women that are spurring us on toward love and good deeds. Someone who's taken spiritual responsibility for my spiritual health and someone that I'm trying to help in the process as well. Then he goes to a second point. He says you have to establish life-giving relationships. Look what he says, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, busy at home, kind and subject to their husbands, that no one will lie on the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Now, I could go in and give you a description of all those things that he told the older men to do, the younger men to do, and that would be really an important thing to discuss. But I think there's something bigger here than just the little details. I think there's a heart here. I think there's a sequence here that must be noted. And that is that those who are older in life and older in the faith, that they have a responsibility, they have a calling To invest Jesus in them into those who are younger in the faith, into those who need guidance and directions. Uh, See, the reality is, is that we have people that are spiritual babies. We have people who are spiritual toddlers. We have people that are spiritual adolescents. We have people that are, are spiritual adults. And what he's saying is, if you get to be an adult spiritually, your job isn't to go, woohoo, I've arrived. Your job is then to go back 
and help those who are infants and toddlers and adolescents. Your job is to help them to reach a point of maturity. And that the process of the gospel, the process of making disciples is when we are continually helping one person reach maturity and then going back and helping someone else to reach maturity and then going back and helping someone else to reach maturity. And every time someone reaches maturity, they go back and all of a sudden, instead of one person doing it, there's two people doing it. And then there's three people doing it. There's four people doing it. And it grows exponentially. We need to understand that the desire here is for each of us to lead exemplary lives in our churches, in our homes, in in our world. And we sit in a seat of influence. When you reach a point where you are able not just to take care of yourself, but you can take care of someone else. And that really is the heart of being a disciple. I, I love what Oswald Chambers says. The call of every Christian is to be broken bread and pour out wine to other souls until they're able to feed on God for themselves. And so I'm helping someone to reach a place of maturity. And because of that, I sit in a seat of influence. If you consider yourself to be a spiritually mature person, if you consider yourself to be an an adult in the Lord, if you think that you can take care of yourself spiritually, then you now sit in a seat of influence, in a seat of responsibility. And God not just expects you, he has called you. To invest your life into those who are behind you in the journey. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's consider the context. If you remember, they were on the island of Crete. And who lived on the island of Crete? Cretans. And Cretans had a horrible reputation. Paul even notes, even one of their own prophets that says, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. In other words, living for Christ on Crete was no church picnic. Dang, that was funny in the first service. Why isn't it funny in the second service? These were relatively new believers living in a place where they were surrounded by notoriously pagan people. Folks, it's not easy to live for Christ in a Christless culture. It's not easy. And by the way, our culture is getting more Christless every single day. Every single day. And so to have someone who has, who has taken responsibility, who can cut through, carve a path, For those coming behind them, it is absolutely essential. Why? Because in a Christless culture, in a pagan culture, it's easy to drift. It's it's easy to get pulled down. If I stood up here and and I brought my son up here and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to pull you up. You try to pull me down. The chances of him pulling me down are greater than the chances of me pulling him up. He has gravity in his favor. Listen, the gravity of a lost world is causing even those who have been saved, redeemed, rescued, set free. It still has a tug that's trying to pull us down to its level. As I thought about that, I thought, you know, we're surrounded by people who tell dirty jokes. And sometimes it's it's hard to not laugh. We're, we're, we live in a, in a time where people curse and say all kinds of horrible things. I, I, you can't go on Facebook. And even sometimes I see Christians on Facebook. I'm going, what are they thinking with the things that they're liking or the things that they're, they're sharing? The things that they're saying? We engage people who are involved in all kinds of gratifying activities and in order to fit in, we start doing them too. We start dabbling with it. We have students that go to school. We have some of us that are in the workplace that we see people cheating to get to the top. And we think, if I don't cheat too, then I'm going to get left behind. All that, all that is the pressure of living in a Christless world. And we are in desperate need for those who are of spiritual influence, those who are spiritually mature, those who are older men, older women in the faith. We are in desperate need for them to carve a new path. To make a way so that they can look and say, come this way. So that the world doesn't get into your hearts. But rather, Christ lives through your heart. And then he gives them a third thing. 
He says, not only are you to, to, to realize that it's going to require personal investment, not only do you need to establish a life-given expectation that it's a continual process, but you need to offer an influential example. Look what he says, in everything, show yourself to be an example by, what, what, by doing what is good. And your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that can't be condemned. So those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say. Two words here. The word show. The word show here means to hold alongside. In other words, let your actions walk alongside of your words. Don't just tell them. Show them. Your, 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 your walk is so much louder than your talk. And so don't just talk the talk, walk your talk. And he says, and he gives this, this word example, tupos. It, it refers to taking a pen and leaving a visible mark. Or, or taking a hammer and nailing something. And if you've ever nailed something, that last strike always leaves a mark on the wood. It leaves an impression. Paul is saying to Titus that we as Christians must have the integrity, the veracity in our faith that is being lived out through our actions, that it leaves an unmistakable impression on other people. And an impression for the glory of God, not an impression for the will of man. What a tremendous challenge. I read a great story about this. I thought it was really a good illustration. It was about St. Francis of Assisi. One day he was going to go into town, and so he invited one of his young friars to go with him. And he walks up to him and says, hey, let's go down to the village and preach to the people. And so the friar goes, all right, great. I get to go with St. Francis of Assisi. We're, I'm, I'm going to be with the man. We're going to go down and we're going to preach. And so he gets all excited and they go down. And as, as they're traveling, they stop and begin to speak to the men on the side of the road who are begging for bread. And then they take time to play with the children and they, they, they shake hands, they hug necks, they have small talk with, with the men and the women who are in this town. And as they begin to turn to go home, St. Francis says, hey, it's time to go back. This young friar looks at him and his apprentice says, when are we going to preach? To which St. Francis of Assisi said, my son, every step we took, every word we spoke, every action we've done. This has been our sermon. This is our sermon. We must not just tell them, we have to show them. And that is at the heart of making disciples. I want you to drop down to verse 15, and I'm going to show you the fourth thing. It says, provide tenacious accountability. He says, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. The word here, encourage, means to walk alongside to give courage. It's to hold someone's hand to see them through. I immediately thought about every time I went to the pool when my children were really young. And we would get them on the side of the pool. And they wanted so desperate to run and jump into the water, but they were scared to do it. Any of you parents remember that? And so I was standing in the water and I would go, come on, it's okay. I'm going to catch you. I'm going to catch you. And they would look at me and go, No. <laughs> and so I would get a little closer. And I'd reach out and I would put my fingers up and they could grab my hands. And as I was giving them assurance that they're going to be caught, that they're not going to sink, all of a sudden, before I could say one, two, three, they were jumping into the water. Because they had this assurance. They knew that I was going to catch them. Folks, accountability inside of discipleship is when we give someone assurance. We hold their hand. We walk them through so they don't have to fear what they're learning. We encourage them. We, we embed courage into their spiritual lives. And that's what Paul is saying, that we have to have this tenacious accountability so that we give courage to those who are following in the faith. But then he uses a second word, rebuke. Interesting word because it, it doesn't mean to be harsh. It means gently to bring to light. So if someone is going in the opposite direction of God, our job isn't to go over and go, you dirty, rotten, filth and sinner, you need to get right with God. What it is, is to walk alongside and say, hey, my, my friend, my brother, you're headed in a way that's going to bring death and destruction to your life. Let me, let me nudge you. Let me lovingly nudge you back to the truth. 
back to God. Now, sometimes it requires a swift spiritual kick. But most of the time, it just requires someone to stand in the gap and say to their brother, to say to their sister, you're not going the direction that God would have you go, and you're going to miss out on what God has for you. And so we bring to light the misdirection of their ways. And this, too, is a part of accountability. So those are the first four things. These are all very imperative. It requires personal investment. It requires that that we engage in a continual process. It requires that we set an example. And it requires that we provide tenacious accountability. But everything really hinges on this last one. Paul tells Titus, what you must do is you have to keep the gospel central. The gospel is the key. He says, for, by, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory and the great, and our, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his own, eager to do what is good. What Paul says is, listen, above all else, you can never lose sight of the cross. Why? Because the cross changed everything. The cross is what's key. There's not one of us in this room who can earn the forgiveness of God. There's not one of us in this room who can do things to cause God to say, wow, you are just so awesome. I'm going to let you into heaven. No, every one of us in this room, we suffered from the same Illness, and that is a cancer called sin. We were inflicted at birth. And because of that, we were all depraved. We were enemies of God. We were separated at odds until God, who was rich in mercy, entered time and space. And he provided a solution, a single solution to the problem of our sin in the person of Jesus Christ. And because of that, the cross has changed everything. It changes everything. For while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. I want you to listen to these verses. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, for God, for, for, for God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. So that we could be made right with God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace, God's grace, you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the free gift of God. Not of yourself, so that no man can boast. Notice, grace, God gave unmerited favor. When we deserved condemnation, we deserved his wrath. God gave us favor. He, in, in his mercy, he extended to us his love. In his mercy, he gave Christ. He literally suffered and for us. He became our sin. And that by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. This is the grace of God. And it's been offered to every one of us in this room. So that while we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated his love for me in this way. And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He took our place. We deserved separation and he gave us life. And, and Paul actually lays this out here in this passage. He says the first thing you need to understand is that God's grace rescues us from sin. He told the Colossians this. He he says, for God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he's brought us into the kingdom of son whom he loves and whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. This is an act of God. See, we were in this sea of sin. We were being bounced around. It wasn't this calm sea. But can you imagine someone driving you, someone, t- someone taking a plane out and dropping you off maybe 500 miles out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and said, good luck. Is there any one of us in this room that would be able to swim to shore? No. But then it just gets compounded because not only you dropped off in this, in this, this huge ocean with no way to swim to safety but then all of a sudden a storm rises up and you're being tossed there are swells 50 100 feet tall 100 feet high there's no chance of survival and god says that doesn't compare to the sea of sin that has dominion over your life and yet god who is rich in mercy 
He comes and through the cross, he can lift us out of this storm of sin and he will come and establish us. He'll colonize us, make us citizens, setting us free, giving us life. And we become his children. You know what we call that? Grace. God's grace rescues us from sin. But even more, God's grace empowers us for victorious living. It's not just, hey, you're saved, way to go. It's you're saved and now this same grace that saves you empowers you to live a victorious living Christ. You are now more than conquerors. Listen to Romans chapter 8. What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And then he drops down and says, what shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger or sword? No. In all these things, what are we? We are more than conquerors. We have victory because of the power of the cross. And he goes on and says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither present or future, any powers, neither height, depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So not only has he given us, not only has he rescued us, not only has he given us victory, but he's promised us that he will be with us and nothing can overcome him. That is a reason to get excited. That is amazing. Talk about power. God has invested his Holy Spirit in you so that you don't just have eternity, but you can have victory here on this earth. Mm. Then there's the last, there's the third thing. He says, God gives grace or God's grace gives us hope for the future. There's going to be a day when Christ returns. And we can have confidence that when he returns, we will be taken with him. But embedded inside of this this truth that Christ is going to return and he's going to have the ultimate victory, there also is a sense of urgency. See, there are people that you and I know, our friends, our family, people that we've not even met yet, who are in desperate need of the grace and the love of God. Remember, the cross is central. The cross can change anything. Anyone. But unless we have a sense of urgency about it, we will keep our mouth shut. We will keep our hands to ourselves, spiritually speaking. And we will stay right where we are, never darkening a world that's in desperate need of the hope of Christ. And yet what he tells us is that everything rises and falls on the cross. No one's life, not even one person, will ever have their life transformed, will ever experience the grace of God, will ever experience the forgiveness of God, will ever experience experience the love of God, unless they experience the cross. And we are messengers of that cross. And And if we lose our sense of urgency, the world, and many people in this world, will never hear about the most amazing love ever given to man. See, this statement here, while Paul was never negating the opportunity to to speak or teach, this word right here teaches us that true ministry, meeting people at the point of their need with the love of God, it requires that you and I get our hands dirty. I don't know if you've noticed, but because people are sinful and because we live in a sinful world, people's lives can get pretty messy. And when you stick your hands into the goop of someone's life in order to love them to Christ, it's not always easy. Oh, let me tell you, it's much easier to stand up here and say, thus saith the Lord. It's a whole lot easier to sit in my office or, or and have someone come and say, man, this is what my marriage is like. Or, or to meet someone for coffee and they'll say, this is what's going on in my business life. Or this is, this is the mess I've made of things. 
And then have to say, okay, so you've made a mess. Let's take it back to the truth of God, to the heart of God, to the grace of God. And let's see how you can step through this, learn from this, so God can do amazing things in and through these circumstances, even though you've made a mess of it in the, in, from an earthly perspective. Discipleship, engaging people in spiritual conversation for the purpose of helping them to have health and helping them have intimacy of God, it's messy business. But yet this is exactly what God has called us to do. And yet what's sad and what's scary to me is we live in a day and time where we think that we can make disciples from pulpits. We think that we can have a Bible study. We can have a seminar. We can have a conference. We can, we can throw money at an opportunity and that's going to solve it. Folks, that will solve squat. God understands What we, I think, have forgotten as a church. And that is the gospel is carried one person at a time. And that we have to engage. So no matter how challenging the world might be, no matter how obstinate and hostile people might be toward the gospel, no matter how scared you might be in a particular situation, the only hope for the world is found at the cross. It's found in one person, Jesus. It reminds me of a story. I know I've shared it here with you all. But it reminds me of a story that when I heard it for the first time, I've never, I've never gotten rid of it. It's just, it, it, it makes itself, it kind of comes up. I guess probably 15, 20 years ago. There was a tremendous storm that went through Moore, Oklahoma. You might remember it was an F5 tornado, the strongest of all the tornadoes. And what was interesting about this tornado was it started about 40 miles outside of Oklahoma City. And if you look, which I flew over it, there was a swath of ground turned up 10 feet deep for 30 miles leading into Oklahoma City. And as you looked at it, as I flew over top, I mean, it was almost a straight line, just directly. And right in the middle of its line sat First Baptist Church of Moore, Oklahoma, a church that was going through unbelievable turmoil because they were fighting among each other. And if there was ever a time where God could have taken a church out, that could have been it. And what's amazing is you could see this if you flew over top. The, the storm was coming, and right at the last minute, It turned about a quarter of a mile around the church and then went back right on its path. Meteorologists have never been able to explain what happened. It was crazy. The only real damage, there was a couple of shingles moved around, but the only real damage to this church was there was a two by four stuck up underneath their 50 foot cross that stood above the, that that kind of stood above the church. When National Guard and FEMA and everyone arrived, the police, and began to try to help the people because they're in this one mile swath, I mean, just devastation. It was like a bomb had gone off. As they're going through trying to help people, dusk fell to darkness. And so they got, because the church was in ground zero, they, they got these huge spotlights and put it up on this cross. And as people, they were going through finding people and people saying, we, we've lost everything. Where do we go for help? Where do we go for help? And these National Guards, these famous workers were, were turning, looking at these people, says, if you need help, go to the cross. Folks, we're in a world where people are desperate. People are broken. People are shattered. Their lives are being turned upside down day after day, minute by minute. And they're in desperate need of hope. And if the gospel is true, which I believe it is, it says that we are to engage the world in conversation, in life, for one single purpose. If you need help, go to the cross. Because the only place you're going to find help. Let me ask you a question. When you needed help, who was there to walk with you? Who was there that helped you to find help at the cross? Are you in need of help right now? We can walk alongside of you and take you to the cross because at the cross, that's when everything can change. 
That's where everything changes. Our invitation is very simple today. If today you've heard about God's amazing love to you and how he desires a relationship with you and you've never, never entered into that relationship, your story is, I've had this, I've had that, but I've never had Christ. I've never experienced God's forgiveness. Then right where you're sitting, you can do that. If you experience the convicting of God, if you experience the nudging of God's spirit, he's saying, right now, I want you to receive me as your savior. He's inviting you into a relationship. And here's all you have to do. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead. You just need to have a conversation with God and say, God, I know you're convicting me. I realize I'm sinful. I realize I'm separated from you. And I understand that at the cross, you came and you took my place. You died for me so that I could have peace with you. And so right now, the best I understand, I want to ask you to be my Savior. The second thing you can do, some of you, you're going, you know, I'm looking for a place that, that I, can, I can find God, I can grow with God. Listen, there are no perfect churches, but there are churches seeking after a perfect God, and this is one of them. If you sense that God's saying, I want you to put your roots down to become part of this family, I want to invite you to come and begin the journey with us. There's, you can begin the first step and we'll take you through and help you to understand who we are, what we believe, why we believe it, and what God expects of you and what we can expect of you and what you can expect of us. But the first step is responding to God's leading. And then there's a third group. There are those of you in this room, whether you are a toddler a teenager, or, 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 or a spiritual adult. God is saying one of two things. It's time for you, if you're a spiritual adult, to begin taking responsibility for someone in the journey behind you. And then there are some of you who are saying, I need someone to help me in my spiritual journey. Here's what I'm asking you to do. My email address is J O E Y. R at fbcptc.org. You can go to the website and you can click on my ugly mug and it's going to bring up an, an email address. You can send me an email. But if today God is saying to you, I want you to take spiritual responsibility for someone else, or it's saying to you, I want you to find a spiritual mentor, email me and we will help make that connection for you. But what we cannot do is we can't sit by and hope that we're going to become more Christian apart from the cross of Christ and apart from accountability, apart from taking personal responsibility for other people. What are you going to do? Let's pray. Father, I pray you take our time. You take this word. And Lord, you begin to help us to understand it, apply it, that, Lord, we would do more than believe, we'd behave. That we would understand that the doctrine you give us leads to a duty, a responsibility that we live out. Not to obtain your grace, but to reflect what you've done in us. Father, I know in this room today there are those who likely have never come to receive you as your person, Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that today they will not leave without talking with you and dealing with you. Father, I know there are people in this room that they've been praying about whether God has called them to be a part of this church family. And Lord, if you've called them, I pray, Father, they would have the courage to come. And Lord, I know in this room there are a number of people who love you, who want to, who want to be used of you. But Father, they've been waiting. Lord, I pray that today will be a day of engagement. Whether they need to be mentored or whether, Father, they need to carve a path for someone else. Lord, may we take up this responsibility that you've called us to. Bless this time, Father. Bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand with me as we worship?